early morning feeding the first thing we do when we get in is just top up the bird feeder occasionally we find a little pile of feathers we know there's a hawk about but he just does seems to have the occasional one all part of a cycle i guess The Royal Horticultural Society have said we are in crisis. The industry is lacking youngsters coming through. This is Eggleston Hall Gardens and over the next 12 months we're going to take you on a journey of what it's like to run a nursery garden. It's week 49 and we're really starting to get a, an empty feel now. These beds have uh, been cleared. All of the trees and the conifers are stacked up into short beds and roped off. And then the beds are pressure washed. And they've already been, uh, Lisa and Thomas have scraped them, brushed and sorted. The drippers all have to be tied in like this, otherwise they tangle up with the pressure washer. Everything has to be lifted off. And if we don't do this, we, we're just harboring diseases. And it doesn't look nice and they're slippery and dangerous. And you just want them clean and tidy, ready for next year. It is a lot of moving about and throughout the summer when you sell a plant you think that's one less I have to move in the winter. It's like when we used to do talks or if you take a load of plants with you it's always nice to uh, sell a few because you don't have to put them back in the van so you go home. That's Thomas by the way. It's pissing with rain at the moment and it's horrible and it's December soon to be Christmas I feel like the Grinch It's absolutely miserable outside so what I'm doing because I'm on my own today, as usual, I am writing up some labels. We have um, some time later today, unfortunately it's not until it's dark almost. I've got a load of uh, bare root trees coming in. These are maiden trees, one year old. And um, we grow our trees like this because we find we can control the habit of them, the rate of growth, the... Uh, shape of them and um uh, it's just it just works really well so we have uh, a friend of ours jeff webb over in um north uh, suffolk is it norfolk or suffolk i can't remember that's norfolk or suffolk is over in the flatlands anyway of east anglia and um he digs them out of the field for us and sticks them all on a pallet and then we get them and pop them on and then we can grow and shape them. I've got here apples coming, uh, cherries, plums, uh, cretaceous, 
Pyrus, that's fancy pears. Prunus, Sorbus, Betula, Carpinus, Quercus, Liquid Ambers, all Maiden Trees. Maiden Tree is effectively just a stick. It's a, a one or two year year old from, from budding or grafting. And um, so, so then, then we pop them on and we grow them on for two or three years so that we get a nice, nice shape, shaped um, uh, plant. And of course, with the apples and the pears and the, fat and the plums, if we start with a maiden, we can then train them into the shape we want. So it's quite important. Um, at most garden centres and that, they buy a finished product, uh, a finished two-year-old tree, three-year-old tree or whatever, or a shaped one. But we like to do it right from the beginning. Um, and that's it. However, when, when, when we do them, we uh, tend to put a tie-on label with the price if people want to buy them at that stage and train their own. But just as an insurance, we put a stick-on label on each pot. So that's what I'm writing up here now. Uh, yeah, that's it. We just put that on the pot and then that should match up um, with the tie on label with the information and the price on. It's just an extra security so that if the tie on label gets lost, we know what's in there because, you know, one apple or one pear, if it hasn't got a label, looks the same as any one until it fruits. It also keeps my ass warm at like this time of the year. It's much nicer sat in here doing this with a cup of cocoa than it is being out there in the pissing rain. <laughs> It's just starting to rain. This is probably going to turn to sleet or snow. You can see, I don't know if this will come up on camera, but the, the distant hills, because we're in a valley, the tops of the Pennines are covered in snow. It sort of stopped further along the dale, but uh, I've no doubt we'll be getting some later today or tomorrow. Wonderful. But it is winter, so what do you expect, you daft old bugger? Yes, just dire. We've moved a few trees and things down to cheer it up. And it's early morning at the moment, so let's go in the shop and turn these things on. It's always depressing in the mornings. Not because you've got a day's work ahead of you, but simply on wet days like this, particularly round here, it's just awful. So, just to prove I'm not too grinchy and miserable, so. I think that looks better. Even in the daylight, it's such a dark old day. How's this for a beautiful Mahonia? Large and just starting to come out. Wonderful plant. So there we have some rhododendrons that Thomas has. These are actually quite large rhodes. Um, you can see where pepper is. Uh, they're in 20 litre pots, so they're all gonna have to go up. Even these ones in 45 litre pots. There's no point leaving them in those. Those have got a, they're a hefty rhodey. If we don't do them now, they go a bit yellow over winter. These were the hollies that we brought down, ready for repotting. They're quite squeezed in there, compressed up. Well, they've all got to be sorted out. Just as an addition, really. We don't put much information on this, just the variety. The tie-on label which we put on the trees has all the information you need, um, how it grows, the shape of the fruit, that sort of thing flavor although that's very subjective isn't it you know what one person likes another person doesn't like i was all, i'm always amazed 
talking about the apple golden delicious and people say ah oh, golden delicious it's bloody horrible it doesn't taste of anything just a second. Just turn this. That's the heater on there. That keeps my ass even warmer. Um, I don't let the others have that on. I say it's too expensive. Anyway, where was again? Uh, Golden Delicious. Yeah, Golden Delicious. When it came out in the early seventies, um became available in this country it was fantastic it was a beautiful apple it was juicy and it had lots of flavor however it became so popular that it became more widely grown and grown in places where it shouldn't necessarily have grown it was often known as french golden delicious because they had a lot more sun and it used to ripen well and it really was a lovely lovely apple but for whatever reason whether it was because of it was being grown in countries where it shouldn't be grown or, as is very often the case with a lot of things, including tomatoes and fruit, it's picked too early. It's picked before it's reached its its, its ripeness. Um, so grown well and grown in the right climate, it is a fantastic apple. It's it's wonderful. Um, so, yeah. And it's, it's, it's French golden delicious. I mean, come on, come on. The French are known for their cuisine. They're not going to have a crock of shit, are they? they? You know, if it's a nice apple... They're going to grow it. If it's horrible, they're not going to have it. They're not, you know, some of the French plums. People say to me, oh, what's a nice, I want a nice plum for my garden, a nice Victoria. Well, yeah, Victoria's good. Fine, it's a lovely plum. It's primarily, it's a cooking plum. But it can also be eaten as well if, it, if it's ripe enough. But it tends to be like the Bramley apple. It tends to be the only one most people know. So they say, oh, I want a nice Victoria, or, or perhaps their grandfather had a, a, a Victoria plum. And it's, there's always that nostalgia thing, particularly in gardening, growing things. Um, but some of the French plums and some of the French pears, they are fantastic. They are like nothing that we eat or try. Uh, they are the most luscious of fruit. Um, and if you live in a climate or you have a really good south facing wall, then I would go for some of these lovely French pears or French plums trained on that wall to get the maximum amount of sunlight. They are beautiful. People say green gauges are nice. They are, um, but they need to be fully ripe. But these French plums and French pears are nothing like a green gauge, the sweetness. They are exquisite. They are, I, I, I can't rate them highly enough, but... This is the north of England. <laughs> Even a south-facing wall is, uh, you know, it might survive and it might grow well, but it's not going to get that all-round ripeness that, that you get grown in it in places where it was bred or or, or grown. So, yeah, I've wondered. From what, but, but the stick-on label stuff, yeah, we just put on here. Plum opal, and I put something at the bottom as to the rootstock because we might do things plum on two different rootstocks. With plums, there's a, a rootstock that grows really huge, the Brompton stock. There's a couple of others as well. And then there is the pixie stock, which I don't like because you get too heavy a crop of inferior quality plums. And and very often it's so heavy that it breaks the branches or you've got to prop them up. So a good compromise is the S. St. Julian stock, which is sort of like a semi-dwarfing. And with apples, we might have um, an apple, say Worcester Pomaine or James Grieve, and a good dual purpose apple, uh, especially for the north. Lovely blossom. It's got beautiful pinky red and white blossom. This is James Grieve. It's a, you can use it as a dessert apple. It's, you can use it as a cooking apple. I mean, what more can you want from a bloody apple? And it grows in the north. So, where was I getting to? I've wandered off the point now. It doesn't really matter. But yeah, we might grow, we might grow James Grieve on two rootstocks. So we might grow it on M26, and we might grow it on a 106, which is a slightly taller growing tree. So we need to put that information on there as well so that we don't mix the two up. Otherwise, you've got a small space. You've got a bloody great tree growing in here. 
going to be coming back here saying, you know, dwarf pan was dwarf apple wasn't very dwarf. That's it. I think it's time for another cup of cocoa now. Yeah, and we're just taking delivery now. Of three pallets of bare root trees. It's nearly dark, but this is just the point of being stuck here. Here we are, those pallets of trees are gonna have to wait till the morning. Well, here we are, early the next morning. Well, there's three pallets of trees. They don't look too many, do they? But there's actually quite a lot. They're really bound up quite um, hard in there. So this is our job for this morning. Get these into the potting shed and put in containers. We can't heal them in because uh, it's really too wet and too far and messy to get them. So what we do is put them in big pots and put compost over them so that we can work over on them over a few weeks or a few days really. You can't just leave them because they're bare rooted. You can't just leave them um, because the roots will dry out, desiccate. So we need to keep the roots slightly moist. Anyway, we'll have a look at them as the morning progresses and we get them in. So unwrapped, you can see what I mean by a bare root tree. Most people will know what I mean, but this is a, is a bare root. Straight out the ground, sometimes washed, sometimes not. This is uh, how the old fashioned way of growing them was. We, we, years ago, we used, everybody used to buy all their trees bare root in the winter. That's why we have a lot today. People say, oh, we can only plant in the winter. That used to be true. It's just a, a vestige of uh, leftover from when everybody bought bare root. Nowadays, providing you can water stuff in the summer when you put it in, because the roots from a containerized plant haven't actually got into the surrounding soil. So even in the summer, you still need to water it until the roots come out of the root ball of the container and into the surrounding soil but with a bare root it just uh it's dormant anyway right we're getting sort of sorted here now this is an interesting thing you can see where the uh tree when it was in the field see all these aerial roots these are roots that are trying to break away from above ground and develop and get into the ground these are what we call aerial roots uh, usually happens when it's quite dark or deep in the row yeah you can see there's there's the surrounding where it was in the soil and here's the roots this is the scion the where the plant was grafted in this case it's uh, probably an apple is it yeah it's discovery on a semi dwarfing stock a 106 stock so that's where the ground it was in the ground this here is the aerial roots this is the scion with the discovery and here is the rootstock. So these roots are coming from the rootstock. Um, yeah, they'll be fine, they'll be fine. So we're putting all the apples together and just um, separating things out into ornamentals and things here. We've got Prunus Palus water eye. That's just a, an ornamental. Yeah, that's obviously a Catoniaster. Uh, what's this? Yeah, it's a little gauge. So we'll put in with the plums. Uh, and here we have um, Sorbus. Sorbus gift colour. Sorbus pile, that's mountain ash. And here, uh, this looks like a, uh, an ornamental pear to me. Yeah, Pyrus Chanticleer. The French love this, goes a fantastic colour in the autumn. Now you can see this plant has got leaves on it still. That's okay, they are more or less dormant. 
um, it'll be fine. They'll fall off and it'll go away next year, perfectly all right. Ornamentals. And then we're just coming through the last of them. This is uh, an apple Katie on an M26 rootstock. So we'll put that with our M26 pile. And then we just continue separating out like this and then shift it round to the potting shed. That's it. So this is our, um, what we do with the fruit trees. They're just put into, um, into pots. And then we put compost around them just to stop the roots from drying out. They just sit here and then we will process them. I may start this afternoon, but we've got to clear away the pallets and tidy up outside. We've still got the ornamentals to bring in. Working on these trees is quite hard in the potting shed. We have, uh, we have an area here where there isn't a full ceiling, so we can use the... Um, the height to uh, pop them up. You'll see that when I start doing them. The far end here, we'll put the ornamentals in when uh, Jan gets his finger out and gets around with the tractor. Right. Her neck it now. Right, Jen and I have just got these in. So this is the things that we've got. These are the dwarf apples which uh, will we be popping up first. These are M26 rootstock, around about six to eight feet. Um, there's a couple of bowls of them. And then we go to the 106 rootstocks. Uh, more apples. We have a few odd pears, but not very many. Then we come into plums. Plums like opal and blue tit. Blue tit is nice because it's a naturally slightly dwarf for a plum without having to want to have one of those horrible pixie rootstocks. And then we come to some apricots, peaches, morello cherries. And then we come down to the ornamentals. We've got sorbus, various prunus, the lovely taihaku, the great white cherry, uh, chiel's weeping, um, cretaceous, the hawthorns, Paul scarlet and pink clouds. And then we come down to Malus, Chanticleer, Catoniasters, a few little oddities that we quite like. So, this is the bare, bare root stuff. We haven't got as many as, uh, as we might have, but there's enough here to be going on with for a week or so. And we'll get these potted up and I'll show you how we do that in a minute. Oh, there's a whole load of soft fruit plants arrived. Nobody's, they, they, they never said they've just dumped them in the shop here and that's it. Bloody hell. All right, at the end of today, we've got a double layer of, um, those are all our M26, the dwarf trees, uh, dwarf apple trees. And I've still got a load of these to do, but these are the 106s. The head will break out from the top buds by around about uh, July next year. And they'll have rooted in nicely by then. So they will be good. You could buy them now, um, but they're effectively a maiden. Um, well, they are a maiden. Um, but once they get growing in around about April time, uh, you've just got to be careful of buying them because... If you plant them, because the roots are starting into active growth around March, April time, if you take them out the pot to plant them, you can break the roots. So you've either got to grow them between now, uh, sorry, plant them between now and say March, April, early April. If you don't, then really these what young ones, you need to, uh, you can buy them, but you need to keep them in the pot. Uh, so that the root 
binds the root ball together I mean, because it's around about around in the spring they start putting on adventitious roots and probably the weight of the soil can when you take it out of the pot can just pull those roots off so it's the end of the day and uh, not explaining that very well uh, so that's why but th another way around it is to take them and then plant the whole thing uh, pot and all into the ground and then around July August time or even later than that um, just take it back out pull the plant out of the pot and put it back in the hole so sort of plunge them we used to do a lot of plunging years ago it was a very effective method of changing um, plants in a bed or growing containerized things so yeah you just plant the, the whole thing pot and all and then you, it's easy to keep watered and there's some capillary action you know the, the roots will find a way through um, from the moisture from below as well yeah. it's a long process and we've had some more bare root stuff come in today uh, we got here yeah there's some roses uh rosa rugosas the uh rosa bonicas some smaller roses some raspberries blueberries for growing on bits and pieces but uh this is a this is a an interesting thing there are five commercially bought black berries. There's five in there. So you're not going to get much, you're just going to get one little stem. And if you remember early in the year, we did our own tip cuttings. Now this is a good reason for doing your own cuttings. There, on the left of the five commercially bought uh, blackberries, and there is the one beautiful long-stemmed tip cutting that we did around about August. It's even got a nice new shoot coming from the base. Two, actually. No comparison. Absolutely no comparison. Here we are at the end of the day. A little task is to feed up, fill up the bird feeders for the morning. You can see they're bloody empty, as usual. I must thank Richard Fleming. Now, Richard Fleming, he's been coming in here all year. He loves coming here for some reason. I don't know why. He must be a glutton for punishment. But he came in today with his daughter and a boyfriend and um, he bought a holly and one or two other bits. And look at that. He bought us some chocolates. He often does this. Now I'm gonna have to hide these because um, there's nobody here at the moment to enjoy them and uh, they really are for everybody. So I'm going to stick them away in the kitchen somewhere. Thank you, Richard. Now, we've done all this before, haven't we? Mealworms, suet and stuff. Oh, you can tell I'm struggling for material. There's nothing really very exciting now. <laughs> the year is pulling to a close. How's that wonderful winter feel? Um at the end of my time for this week now so uh, I'm quite pleased about that I've got two or three days off now one which will be spent trying to edit something out of uh, this week's material which isn't very much oh, silver purse out of a pig's ear I really do not know what to put in 
I'm in the woods again. Ever since we started doing this video malarkey, I've um, I found myself in all sorts of woods all on my own, like Billy Nomades. Um, and here I am again. I'm in the woods just near Eccleston Hall Gardens, another set of woods. This is really nice. I haven't been here before. There's um, streams in all directions. I'm at some sort of crossroads of water here. There's sort of quite dark, sort of, what's that, a ravine or something like that. It's lovely. I'm, I'm down in the woods today because the poem I picked today is by um, Robert Froster. I think a few of you will know it. It's called Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Um, it, it isn't actually snowing, but earlier this week it snowed and that's all the excuse we need to get out a load of snowy pictures and start to feel more seasonal. So I'm going to read this poem for you and see if you like it. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. I will just point out here that the way into these particular woods um, is via a gate that's very well locked up. So Malcolm gave me the option of either climbing over the gate, and I'm, I don't think I'm up to that, or what he suggested was squeezing under this. I mean, I, I can't get under that. I'd have to be some sort of limbo dancer. But anyway, what I tried to do on the way in was step over it and 
Well, I won't be cycling again in a while, I can tell you. Thank <laughs> you.